and hello to everybody on day two, day two now, of the home yoga retreat. For some reason it feels like a lot longer, but I think time is doing this weird lockdown thing that it is, yeah, somehow. <laughs> it's kind well, of it's difficult to, it's diffi I think it's hard to mark time actually right now. It's hard, we, we haven't got the kind of usual markers. So I think you're right, like time is becoming, you know, a nebulous idea right now. Yeah, it sure is. Um, and yes, just to, I'm just going to briefly introduce everyone. I'm sure there's nobody here who doesn't know Lucy, who is, um, well, hopefully you've done Lucy's practice this morning and you've enjoyed that. And there is also a short afternoon practice to be done. But um, Lucy is one of my favourites. It's bad to have favourites, but hey, um, teachers on one life. And the lovely thing about your classes is, um, well, they're just so varied, aren't they? It's like you do everything from quite tough vinyasa. You've now got your pregnancy classes, yeah, uh, just starting to come out, so that's pretty cool. And some meditation, sleep classes, your chakra series. Not to forget that. That was that's a classic. So. Um, yeah, I think that your classes sort of cover the widest range of anyone. So that's really, really cool. It's something for everybody. And I think everybody always says how much they enjoy your very clear and accessible instruction. That's something which obviously for online, when you're, you don't want to be craning your neck at the computer. That's yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think that's the thing. It's almost like you want... You want to just be able to follow the teacher's instruction, but also kind of while staying embodied in your own practice, you know, like a bit of both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, while well, staying here now, right? <laughs> quite, Kat, quite, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was so happy though when you wrote to me and said that that was the theme, I was like, that is a killer scene. Brilliant. And um, oh, we've got a few people watching with us. Hello, hello. So, hello, Heidi. Hi, Lisa. Lisa has done both the practices. Gold star to you. Uh, well and, done. Enjoyed. and hello, Lara. And I can see that Hannah and Vera are on there. So this is like, uh, um, this is a lot of people who were on our retreat last year at Sierra Lila are here. Yeah, from in-person retreat to an online retreat. How wonderful. That's pretty cool. So it's like a reunion and with some extra folks as well. So that's pretty lovely. And hello, Emma. It's lovely to see you here too. So, um, of course, the reason why I chose the theme Be Here Now for our second retreat is because I'm, I, and I know lots of other folks, are feeling it's like a sense of restlessness. There's a bit of discomfort going on. It's like at first, five weeks ago, it was like, okay, we're coming home. What does it mean to be home? Yeah, and, um, it was like uh, it, it was a different uh, it was a different vibe. It was like you know, home before for a lot of us was something just a place that we used to sleep, and now our home is really feeling like home. Oh, we're joined by more. Hiya, Kathy. It's a lovely evening. It's good to hear you. And hello, Frankie. I'm glad you're loving day two. Hello, Laurel. And and Laurel also loved your class this morning. Hiya. Yeah. Hello, Rosie, and love your class, Rosie, and hi, Cindy, great to have you here too. Um, so we're joined by loads of lovely folks. And so after the initial theme of homecoming, this theme of being here now, it's sort of about what is it to stay, to stay where we don't want to stay, basically, to stay in a less comfortable place. And it was interesting because in Mimi's meditation, um, yesterday and her sort of opening thoughts she mentioned that it was that kind of whether it's an amazing feeling whether you're having the best time of your life whether you've been waiting for lockdown all your life and you love this feeling of having no schedule and lots of time or whether you're feeling really uncomfortable we all have the same thing to do which is just to be here now yeah, and as you were saying, you know, it is that there is nothing else but to feel embodied, as she said, in a lot more um, clear and coherent way in that story, but nothing more than to just be embodied in the here and now. So that is, of course, one of the key yogic principles 
Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, what, when you were just talking then, the thing that really reminded me is that one of my teachers talks about, and this comes actually from, um, you know, the ancient yogic scriptures and philosophies, to be in this middle place where we are neither grasping and clinging mm -hmm. and we're also not in a state of aversion. And I think this is so interesting because I think we get, you know, the, the aversion thing is kind of obvious, like resistance is futile. Mm -hmm. If you're in a difficult situation and you're resisting it, it makes it worse. Yeah. And so I think that, not that that's easy to do, but it's kind of easy to grasp. But I yeah. think the harder thing to grasp is when we're in, like you said, a, a, a mm -hmm. delicious situation or, you know, where we're really enjoying something and actually to be able to stay open handed and be like the nature of reality is impermanence. Therefore, this will not last. And so can I soften and open into it being what it is for mm -hmm. this moment, but without going? Because often I think when we're in a state of enjoyment, actually it's tinged with already the anticipation of it coming to an end. Yes. And then, you know, you're almost missing out on actually just being in it. You know, I think that happens a lot when you're on holiday, for example, you know, yes. you get into the swing of the holiday and then as you peak towards the end, there's already the anticipation of going home. And it's almost like you lose the, the pleasure of just mm -hmm. actually being in it. And I think this is a super, a super yogic practice of like this, like equilibrious place of, you know, mm -hmm. neither going, oh, let me have that desire, desire, desire mm -hmm. versus, oh, I don't want that. It's actually just, mm -hmm. right, this is what it is. And mm -hmm. how can I meet it in a way that is open and receptive to whatever uh, we have to learn? Because I think that's another thing is, I mean, certainly in my own life, it's like usually the juicy transformative times have often been the harder times, mm -hmm. you know, have often been when my desires haven't been met, my expectations mm -hmm. haven't been met. But actually, those are the ones that have been like the rich kind of deep uh, evolutionary times of my life, actually. Yeah, right. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I th yeah, for me, for sure, like part of my sort of transformation story, how I went from being a corporate lawyer to, um, uh, you know, setting up Movement for Modern Life was I went through three horrible events. Yeah. A, a divorce, a car crash, and my dog dying of cancer. And all of those led me to taking a completely different path and one which has been richer, more fun, more challenging than ever. And I'm sure in the in the moment, if you were to look back in those moments and be like, if someone had said, all this is going to lead you to where you want to go, you probably would have wanted to swear at them. Well, <laughs> and I'd be absolutely. like, yeah, sure. But actually now, like you said, you probably wouldn't change it for the world because it's led you to this whole project, this whole process. Absolutely. Absolutely that. And um, yeah, I would have definitely shot them if I'd have had a gun because it was, it hurt. Yeah. 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 That really, really, really hurt. And that's the thing there, like when we go through that period of a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, um, it's lovely that there can be something that we can really glean from it the other side. And that's, that's what I've found. Um, yeah, it's interesting as well, because I was also just suddenly thinking about how, you know, again, embedded within yogic philosophy is, you know, this idea that the mind creates duality. So it right. says either something that's happened to us is good or bad. And so we immediately align with that point of view. Mm -hmm. And and it's the same with even sensations. You know, oh, this is a good sensation, a pleasurable mm -hmm. one, eating cake, mm -hmm. eating chocolate, whatever, whatever your thing is, versus, oh, this is a horrible one. Whereas actually, you know, a lot of the yogic teachings are, are inviting us to step back from duality and mm -hmm. actually just for things to be as they are, sensations, like love is a sensation as much as hate is a sensation, but naming it starts to create this, this chasm where we either, you know, are attracted to it and pull towards it and mm -hmm. grasp or we push it away. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another thing that is the hard but juicy work within our practices. Can we sit in a place of actually being open to the possibility that what our mind is telling us is a negative, difficult thing? potentially actually at the root of it has a lot of juice in it for us if we don't just name it because it's like for example you know if I have a sore elbow maybe that's the reality I have a sore elbow mm -hmm. but then if my mind is adding to oh poor me I've got a sore elbow isn't this bad now I've got like a, mm -hmm. a physical pain and a mental pain and an emotional pain you know and I have to say that you know for me my meditation practice has been one of the things that has taught me that is that if you kind of sit and sink into just sitting with sensation as it arises, 
you from like a very embodied way you start to see the nature of impermanence it's like Albo is in pain and then the, the sensation shifts and then the, oh, you know it never stays the same and that has that are uh, that's helped me a lot actually it just dealing with just situations that we would usually resist against like I remember coming back from a a long 10-day meditation retreat called Vipassana where you learn this very much and I remember coming back into London and being on the tube and there was a delay and we got stuck on the tube and I just watched like myself and everyone around me start to react mm -hmm. and then I thought oh like I'm I had this immediate sensation of like oh but I'm not going to be on this tube forever and right. as soon as I as soon as my body my mind like clocked that I was just like oh okay I can use this time to sit and breathe or read or and as soon as I dropped into that kind of reaction to it or response versus a reaction I actually found I could enjoy it whereas I remember many times before in my life I would have just been sat on the tube like getting more and more and more not and I will look, I would looked around and that's kind of what was happening mm -hmm. around me and I just think actually once you start this journey you I feel like you feel a bit like you're reclaiming some some power around how to navigate your life with more freedom oh that's interesting isn't it yeah and um that of course is is what we're all wanting because the other thing that being on in that delayed train or in this frustrating scenario is that we want to plan stuff yeah so oh if the train is delayed by five minutes i might be able to do the meeting by this way if it's delayed by 10 minutes well i'll have missed the interconnection so oh. you know and like each minute you're watching by oh okay so this means this minute and this is exactly what's going on in my thoughts at the moment in lockdown it's like okay so we're going to get our sort of lockdown plan and everybody wants certainty that's the thing that people are most wanting and it's interesting that that's the thing that people are most wanting. They're wanting to know what the future will bring and what we can all do. So, like, okay, well, if I can go out in June, then da da da. And then, yeah. and I go down this sort of rabbit hole of thought yeah. around it. And it's so interesting because I think that for me has been one of the most interesting things about this whole process of being on lockdown is that this opportunity to just see how attached to planning and future mm -hmm. we are. And mm -hmm. how how kind of ridiculous the idea of security is, you know, no matter how mm -hmm. smart all of the analysts and the projectors could have been, no mm -hmm. one knew this was coming. Mm -hmm. And actually the fact is, is this yeah. is just a big expression of what life is like all the time. We never know what's happening tomorrow. And the yogic whole philosophy has been trying to teach us that, that mm -hmm. there is nothing else other than now. There's no more certainty than this breath in followed by that breath out. That's it. There is, and actually to, to grasp and grip onto the idea of security is ultimately going to take us into suffering, you know? And it's that, you know, and it's such, it's not, I'm not saying this is easy. It's, it's deep, 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 rich work. But the, actually the idea that in each present moment, there's everything we need on offer, you know? Because the minute you're out of the moment wanting something else, the moment is substandard, mm. you know? And it's like, I think it's just so interesting how much desire and expectation navigates our life mm -hmm. and how often we're not present. Like I remember one of my teachers, Max Strom, who you know, mm -hmm. he'd always, you know, he's, he's a very good one for kind of asking pointed questions. And I remember in a class once he said, you know, remember the best day of your life. And then he left some time and you're kind of thinking, God, what's the best day of my life? And going through all these options. And then the next bit, he was like, oh, remember the worst day of your life. And you're like, well, there's this one and this one. And then it was so interesting because he said, actually, part of the reason why so many people find it harder to remember the best day of their lives is because they often weren't even there, present to it. Mm -hmm. And they certainly haven't replayed it the amount of times that we've replayed. Replayed the bad the, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting because yeah, I was yeah. thinking about, you know, what, what does it mean to be here now? And what, what are the experiences in my life that are being here now? And, you know, certainly for me, it's often, um, you know, moments of awe, whether it's seeing that, um, like sunrise or a beautiful nature vista or this intimate connection with a person, because what it does is it, it stops everything. 
it mm. stops the mind it stops the progressions pro projections it stops the future it stops the past you are just in life right there right that now in that embodied place mm. and i think you know those are the moments we actually remember because that that aliveness that in being here now stopped all of the other blah blah you know internal whirrings of the mind being on the hamster wheel of planning 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 you know yeah and it's um, such a waste it's such a waste of energy that's the thing mm. because by the time we've got to the future it's so different to what we thought it was going to be i know and the future is never like you're not exactly the same person that you thought that you would be in any event when you're trying no. to do it everything changes but there's a couple of things that have come up for me um in the last day or so yeah. as i've been um present with my theme of brain present mm. and one of it has been i and i i would love to know if this resonates with anybody else but i've been aware of exactly what you've been saying relaying that story about max so we are a lot more aware of our negative things that happen than the positive Mm. So uh, I have a gratitude practice, which I bang on about a lot because it's really helped me. But something that I'll do, for example, at the moment, there's lots of beautiful spring flowers where mm. I live. It's wonderful. And often I'll be like, oh, this is nice. And then, I'll, oh, I'm grateful to be here. And then I move on. But now what I'm doing is I'm saying, this is nice. And I'm staying and I'm taking 10 breaths. Mm. In that, this is nice. To really make it sink in more, yeah, make that more present. So, um, yeah, that has really been something which today I've been doing, and it's helped. And you know, that's a very interesting thing. Like one of my teachers, Clive, talks about this about how actually the minute we start to comment and narrate around the event, we've mm -hmm. already like already separated right. ourselves from it. So in a way, it's like rather than being like, oh, what a beautiful flower, because that immediately is making a me and a flower as separate mm -hmm. things versus just kind of being yeah, in, the in, in the moment, in the space, in just a, a moment of enjoyment without having to, um, you know, internally mm -hmm. dialogue about it. But it's so hard because we're so used to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And actually, in lots of ways, language is a wonderful thing, but sometimes it actually usurps of just being in the situation of enjoying the food without needing to stay it's delicious of enjoying you know the, the the flower or the smell without having to comment upon it so I love that you're taking just time just to be with the flowers how amazing but that's very interesting that you've said that about the language being a distance because it's about that separation isn't it yeah it's about that feeling of duality okay so uh, that thing of the duality being the thing that is causing the pain so yoga is unity that's one sort of interpretation of the word yoga right we're all trying to move into the sense of union so here i am i'm trying, trying to take time to appreciate to be in the moment to be like i'm really loving this so let me enjoy but even by doing that i'm causing more separation i'm causing more suffering yeah and I mean, this is like juicy, deep kind of uh, <laughs> mind befuddling uh, the philosophy, because in some ways, philosophy is amazing. And I love mm -hmm. yogic philosophy. Um, and but the thing that's quite interesting is that often we're approaching it from a place of the mind. But actually, mm -hmm. in truth, all of the teachings say that the true awakening is beyond what the mind can grasp. So if people are like, what are you talking about? It doesn't you know, it the mind can't actually grasp these states. But I think you're absolutely right that you know, just the, the the language can often get in our way. Even the mm -hmm. idea of saying, you know, my this, my that, mm -hmm. immediately is creating a separate individual, you individual me. And actually, you know, from my understanding of the yogic teachings is once we begin to soften into this embodied awareness that we are connected to everything else, mm -hmm. if we are connected to everything else, if there is that feeling of unity, there's nothing lacking because there's no me and other. There's just one thing of which I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that lack comes into, a, you know, the fear of missing out, the, the lack, the, the sense yeah. of almost sometimes entitlement, like every moment should be beautiful. Every moment should be joyous. It's like that's mm -hmm. not the nature of reality. The nature of reality is this big totality but that's filled in the material realm of duality. <laughs> and so it's, it's how do we navigate that place whereby 
you know, our practices help us to remember that we are part of the bigger whole, mm -hmm. but that also we don't, you know, we, we are not in control. Actually, that's a, and a, a lot of people. I think that's why we're so uncomfortable right now is because we are give, being given this visceral lesson of, you know, we thought we were in control. We thought we knew what, you know, our summer plans were and, you know, people are having to just constantly open their hands and let go of being like, oh, well, that yeah. trip's gone and that idea was gone. And, yeah. you know, and that's very hard for people to soften because I think there's a lot of fear around the unknown. Of course. But I also think the fear for me anyway, for my own journey around that is for me, it was not so much the fear of the unknown. Actually, what I was more scared of was I didn't know that I had the ability to cope with the unknown. I didn't know if I was going to react really badly to the unknown. And so it was almost that. And as I've, you know, kind of use these practices to get to know myself better and mm -hmm. embrace and accept the ups and downs of being human, that's kind of softened me into, you know what, when, when, when I get to the difficult moments, I'll navigate them because that's just what happens. Because actually, I don't know about everyone else, but for me, my idea of something is usually much worse. Like my fears about things are usually much worse than what they come to. Because in the moment you're just living it and you're, you're going through it and mm -hmm. you know, every, everything does carry on. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's suffering, but actually life carries on and you move mm -hmm. through it, you know, as best you can. And then before you know it, you're dealing with whatever life throws at you next. And, and the funny thing is, funny ha ha, when shit does hit the fan, excuse my language, <laughs> It's nothing that we could have dreamt up anyway. Yeah. Oh <laughs> like, my gosh. Really yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah, absolutely. I love what some people I'm seeing what some people are saying. Yeah, they do to be great great comment. present, like mindful walking, totally drawing. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Yeah, I yeah, this is so good. That's that's Emma with the drawing. That's such a great, great one. Um and hello, Hannah, and I'm so glad. Diane Earl is now on and I'm very glad that you're part of this retreat too Diane you're on the last one and I'm really really chuffed that you're here um so yeah I think that if we're able to share the things that are bringing us into the present that would be very useful because I think like in the way that Mimi yesterday was sharing the bread making the seven minutes mm. of kneading yeah that's a really, really lovely thing to do. And now well, it's interesting of the, me noting the flowers and yeah. the separation. And it's so interesting, Kat, because again, was, I was thinking about what you were saying at the beginning of how, you know, we're just in this. We're now, you know, the first bit mm -hmm. was novelty and now we're just in this. And I think part of what is shocking so many people is that, you know, normally when the outside world is running, we have a million distractions that yeah. we can run away from the, this, the discomfort. Yeah. Whereas I think a lot of us are being brought into a simpler way of being yeah. where a lot of the distraction tactics are no longer working or don't feel good anymore. And so actually coming back to these simple things like walking mindfully, knitting, drawing, noticing a flower, coming back to our breath, kneading bread is actually these very simple kind of age tested ways of yeah. actually just being with whatever is arising rather than running away from it because again I think a lot of the yogic teachings are that you can try to run away from it but eventually it's gonna it's gonna come back you know mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um and that's the thing because life without the distractions is it, it is is real and that's the hard bit it's sort of facing facing the impermanence as you say and um I suppose the deepest thing about this COVID um, and the biggest learning, it makes me feel like it really is a very spiritual lesson that we're all being sent, is that it is teaching us that we can't guarantee our life. And we all know that. We all know that, you know, we're vulnerable and we will die. But the actual thought <laughs> that we're vulnerable and we could die. Well, I think that's what's so interesting about the yogic practices is they are practical. It's mm -hmm. about, yes, you could read all day long about enlightenment or about, mm -hmm. you know, what yeah. South America's like to visit. But actually, unless you've gone there, yeah, right. it's just con it's conceptual knowledge. And I think you're absolutely right that right now, what, you know, amongst the many challenges is we are being gifted the opportunity to really embody and put into practice, like, 
what is it to be here now? You know, what is it to actually sit with what's arising rather than just running away from it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And um, we've got some, yeah, lovely comments. Cooking um, and dancing. Oh, yeah, dancing is such a good one. Yeah, yeah. And this is great. It's interesting to note that what's taking me out of being in the present is the thought of lockdown ending. That's it. That's the same with me. So it's a thought and the planning and the unknown and a wonderful lesson in impermanence. It really is. I mean, I don't think there could be any better spiritual teaching than going through lockdown. It's a pretty amazing gift. And I think what I, I find so um, interesting is there feels like there's a commonality of like in the beginning when people first go into lockdown, because it's interesting for me because I've been in um, Madrid throughout this, but a lot of my family and friends are in the UK. So we were a little bit behind what was happening in Italy, but we were a little bit ahead of what was happening in um, the UK. So I was kind of watching these kind of phases and I felt like we all went through the phase of initially resisting it. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of get into the scene and actually people started to find their groove. And then suddenly now it's the idea of like, oh, but are we finishing? And it's each each phase kind of brings its own challenge. But mm -hmm. it's funny, I have had friends be like, oh, you know, I was resisting it, but now I've kind of got into like a rhythm and, oh, I don't really know what I feel about, you know, the whole real life yeah. uh, smashing back in. So it, it is it is interesting, but I do think, and I've been trying to do this myself of like, you know, what are the lessons I do want to take from this? What are the things that I want to keep what are the things I'm happy to keep having let go of? You know, mm -hmm. what things do I not want to reintroduce back into my life? Because, uh, you know, I think this will be probably the experience of our generation of this degree of everything coming to a standstill. Mm -hmm. I mean, never again, you know, like now, if a plane rarely goes overhead, it's like, oh, a plane. Whereas normally, you know, they're just there. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think that's such an interesting place to be spiritually, like you say, to be, Mm. in this having been gifted this pause yeah 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 absolutely um and i think that because here in the uk we're a bit behind you and we will be thinking about what is it to come out of it but i think to be able to stay with it to be able to stay with this is lockdown this is what it means this is the present and these are the little gifts that I'm able to find along the way is, um, I think that's, that's the most important thing. Because also we're never going to know how we're going to react when it happens anyway. No amount of theorizing is oh, yeah. going to necessarily make that exit smooth or not smooth. We just don't know. Yeah, exactly. And we've got an interesting one in Italy. We're in the, sec we're in the second day of semi-lockdown and it's unnerving when everything changes. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, because we get into our lockdown routines. Yeah, and 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 it's not all, that's the thing. I think initially, you know, it was a real knee-jerk response of like, this is bad, full stop. But then yeah. actually, I mean, certainly here in Madrid, it's like, I just had this cascade of bird song that's built up day and day and day and day. And as we've slowly started to be allowed out more, now you hear a mix of bird song and people. And I, I feel internally mixed about that. I'm like, Oh, I really, it was really quiet. And <laughs> so it is, I think it's, re it's really interesting how, again, yeah, we, we are revealed that change is something that I think the human race doesn't naturally melt into in a soft way. Mm. Because it's, it comes back to that not knowing. We want it to be certain. Like you said, Kat, that, that desire, that longing for certainty, which I, is a fallacy. Yeah. Sorry, right. everyone. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Harsh. It, it is though from a from a from a like the great enlightened masters and the yogic wisdom it is there is we the only certainty is you'll probably take a breath when you're born and you'll take a breath when you die and everything else is up for grabs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and um found lockdown a blessing and i want to hang on to it and i'm i'm mm. the same it has to be said i love being peaceful and I love the fact that I live somewhere now that's totally quiet and I absolutely embrace all of the changes from lockdown so I also am feeling that thing of that holiday thing of I don't want this to end which is just as damaging as feeling I want this to end 
Mm. But also, I think, isn't that amazing to have learned something? Like, oh, actually, I'm more of an introvert than I thought. Actually, being alone and having quiet time is perhaps more vital to my well-being than I was allowing it to be. And so, therefore, how can moving forwards eventually, like, how how am I going to commit to this being more part of the way I choose to live going forwards? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think that's right, to be able to take... Um, Take some notes on what's occurring, but I'm going to give you all a bit of a spoiler alert that Ooh. we are going to do a third home yoga retreat. And that is going to be on basically when we're starting to return to normal. Mm. And it is going to be that thing of what is it that has really worked for you and what hasn't worked for you. And mm. How can we bespoke our lives better? Because I think a lot of us are, um, you know, we just do the things that, you know, we're on a little track. We're on the track. We're all told to do what we do. And, you know, we have our meeting scheduled, our life scheduled. And how can we go off the rails? <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because, I mean, this is my one of my works in progress in life which I've gotten better and better at is, you know, I think the addiction to busyness, you mm -hmm. know, like, and uh, that's one thing I have enjoyed is that actually I've had mm -hmm. a level of regularity during this period that I haven't had before. Like every Tuesday I take, you know, an online yoga class with my friend Tam in Australia. And on Fridays mm -hmm. I take my online yoga class with my friend in Ibiza. And I, you know, that because of the way that like life pulls you in 10 directions and mm -hmm. you've always got so many plans. I've, that's been something I've actually really relished really loved. and I do think I think we are a little bit addicted to movement and speed and action and doing and it's not that any of those things are bad but I think it's when there's only that and mm -hmm. none of the stillness and none of the slowing down and none of the the quietness that balances it out I think that's when our nervous systems and our emotional just general well-being goes a bit wonky and so that's certainly something that I too am kind of thinking like, oh, how can I, how can I maintain some of the, the slowness, the simplicity? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and this is so interesting. We've had um, a couple more comments, Emma. Yeah, we're very controlling in our human nature and it doesn't always serve us. And that's absolutely right. And I'm the first to sort of put my hand up and say I'm absolutely controlling. And I, that's that's definitely something which I'm really, really trying to work with, is to just be more in the present. And that's why this sort of learning about what the teachings about the present moment, they're really... Yeah. Important. Well, also because I think actually, I think certainly from my own life experiences that actually if everything we wanted, all of the controlling behaviour manifested, life would be deeply unsatisfying and very boring first of all. And so actually often, you know, the twists and turns of life bring us much more magical, mysterious, amazing things than we could have ever have dreamt up in our mind. Yeah, and then, yeah, I really, I really appreciate someone talking about the samskaras. So the samskaras mm -hmm. are like these kind of grooves. We get stuck in these grooves and we, we kind of cultivate these bigger and bigger grooves where it's almost like we forget any other way of being. Mm -hmm. And I do think, you know, this, this, this quiet, you know, internal period we've been given gives us a chance to notice like, wow, even in lockdown, I still want to fill my schedule or even in lockdown, blah, blah, whatever our truth is. Mm -hmm. And I think awareness, you know, being present to noticing our tendencies, noticing when we're restless, why we're restless, what the behavior then happens to be, because usually these tendencies then lead to action and then it just, mm -hmm. it cycles, you know? And at some point, you know, they talk about actually you just, you know, step off the track and go in a different direction, but it takes a lot of awareness and falling in the same hole or falling in the same grooves over and over before you realize that. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to find out a little bit more about those samskaras as well, Lucy. <laughs> because that, that's, um, it, it, it's kind of, it, it's a fascinating thought and I think that would be helpful to sort of dig, dig a little bit deeper in, yeah. you know, what they are, how they came about, um, well, I mean, there's there's many different views on it. You know, I think in what's interesting is there are lots of kind of um, crossing overs of m more like modern psychology. You know, so it, to, from more of like a modern psychology way, it could be that these these samskaras go back to childhood, 
where something happened to us and we learned how to navigate a certain way. And that, that in that moment solved a problem or helped us cope. But it was just in the moment responding to that situation. But then that just becomes our constant coping mechanism, yeah, you right. know? And so there's that, that view of it. And then from a, you know, from a yogic point of view, um, certainly some of the traditions would be believing in, in reincarnation mm -hmm. so that these would be connected to our karma, connected to our behaviors of past that then start to recur. And, you know, the idea being that we, the rebirth process would be happening so that we can work through these things and evolve. And once you're fully evolved and you've cleared all of your samskaras, these grooves, these traps you get into, then eventually you you don't have to be reborn again because you've kind of worked through your karma. So there's, I mean, there's lots of different kind of theories around it, but I think all of us know that. All of us know that we've got uh, tendencies and many of those tendencies aren't actually helpful to mm -hmm. our overall well-being. And I think the worst thing about them is that they feel deeply out of control because before we know it, we've acted in that same way again. Yeah. And it's and we've done it bef before we even had consciousness to be aware of, you know? And I think that's where, certainly for me, my, my brain and learning meditation and learning to be present has helped with overcoming some of those samskaric tendencies because suddenly you're about to do something and you stop and you think, ooh, actually do what is that going to take me towards freedom and peace or is that going to take me away hmm. mm -hmm. am I going to make a new choice but it it's a lot of awareness first before you get to then the new pathways mm. so that's the sort of first uh, the first thing is having the awareness of what it is that our sanskaras are what our little habits and our ticks are because mm. in that philosophy we will keep cycling in this life and the next life and all the lives until we um and, until we actually can um deal with it properly yeah or life happens to you you know or big things happen in life and i feel it's a bit like the the universe giving you you know it's been giving you a flu few slaps to be like wake up mm -hmm. bad idea bad tendency but if we ignore them we usually get like a a big yeah, right. slap uh that's kind of impossible to not react to you know and I slightly feel like we're having a global slap. A global slap. <laughs> you right now, you know, like we've been, you know, there's been some really Warm. bad fires and there's some wars and some famine and all of this stuff, you know, and global warming, but we weren't doing enough. I mean, who knows? But yeah, you could see it from that point of view. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's it's so interesting. Um, since 32 weeks pregnant, feeling the same, gone from being hectic to now taking a slower pace. And this is very interesting that there are lots of us who are enjoying this. Yeah. This time and going from being very busy, I'm going to recover my phone so I can see. Well, it's difficult as well, isn't it? Because I do think we are um, currently in most of us, you know, if we're living in kind of Western civilized society, whereby speed and achievement and success and doing are the things that are validated we don't usually get a pat on the back for saying oh last night I went to bed really early and had 12 hours sleep and I've ate really nourishing food and then I did an hour of restorative yoga like those aren't the things that get excited about whereas oh I did this and then I did this and it's very difficult to actually give yourself permission to step out of that if it's not in alignment with your truth and so I think in a way like Amy was saying a lot of us are being given this permission to actually be like oh wow it turns out <laughs> some of those tendencies some of those ways of being some of those kind of societally encouraged practices actually don't feel good to me yeah. and we've been given the chance to then go oh well maybe we just don't pick all of them up again yeah right yeah 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 that's a, that's very interesting so it's a time to really reflect on which of the practices are working for us and which aren't yeah and i suppose that practice of coming into presence is the really the way that we can way, way that we can do this because it's only by being present that we're gonna really know that we're yeah. aware and i think also giving us the space giving ourselves the space to reflect and be still and quiet enough to actually almost catch up with everything that's been going on. Because I think usually there's just so much stimulation that 
we are we've barely recovered or integrated one event before we've then uh, moved on to the next one. Whereas actually, this is actually at a time when I feel like, oh, there's been enough of a pause that you can really go, oh, okay, let's actually reflect. And what is it that I want to call in? What is it I want to draw in? Whilst also acknowledging that, you know, we co-create. I, I, I am a believer that we co-create. I don't think you can just go, I want this, 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 this universe. I don't, that's not how I think. But I do think there's a lot to be said for becoming clear about what you do want to invite in and what you do want to let go of, you know? Like I found myself during these, you know, these periods doing lots more journaling and writing lists about, you know, whatever's coming up for me. And I found that very helpful for kind of clearing it out of my mind into something else. Mm. Mm. That's, a, that's a really, really good idea. I'd love to find out if anybody else has been journaling through this time, because um, it's something that I'm not very good and disciplined at. But actually, now you've said it, that's going to be, I'm going to do that this evening because there is a lot of stuff that's coming up because it does at this weird time. Yeah, it's interesting. I I'm sure loads of people have um, heard about this book, but there's this book called The Artist's Way. Mm -hmm. And um, it's all about kind of inviting more creativity into your life. But it's like one of the most profound practices it and fundamental practices it suggests is what's called your morning pages. So you mm -hmm. basically get up in the morning and just write three pages of like, stream of consciousness whatever and usually it's just blah blah worried about this uh, da, da, da. and then it's amazing that after you know afterwards you do you just you feel like ah oh, cleared out the garbage took out the garbage and now there's space for the new day to go and that's certainly something I, it's not something I always do but I definitely notice in times where I feel like oh I'm up to the top and I don't I haven't quite got the ability to clear out everything I need to from my conscious mind. Mm. Sometimes just writing it out helps, but it, it just depends on what your your mm. kind of predilections like. But it's, it's great to hear because Hannah has said that yeah, she's been journaling lots and has mm. found it helpful. And Julia too, keeping a COVID journal. I think that's mm. such a great idea. Well, it's uh, amazing to think, isn't it? Because actually, probably historically, you know that's where they got a lot of their information from about times of plague and things like that, where people were actually, you know, writing about those experiences. And it's weird to think, you know, if you were to zoom forwards into the future and they were looking at, you know, our, our journals to get a sense of like, what was it like during this big COVID thing? Yeah, right. And, and, and the journaling actually is something that's hit. This is something that lots of folks are doing. So, Emma, teach creative writing, um, mm. reflective and creative writing, and it's so valuable to mental health. Oh. So, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Raki is a prolific journaler, um, but not during lockdown. Now, that's interesting, Raki, but um, lockdown hasn't brought out your writing ways um, Presumably because you've been so busy writing our challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's been different type of journaling. Different type of journaling, and thank you for doing that, Raki. Um, Jada has been doing this for a long time, but more so right now, and thinking of getting into the artist's way. So that's interesting. This is something that is helping a few people. And Ben, right now, this is interesting. I can recommend the book Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, which is seminal for seeing things as they are. Mm. I, I haven't read that book, but I Me really neither. Like the sound of it. I really like the sound of that, Ben. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, um, journaling, Heidi's doing that. Even if you don't read it afterwards. Oh, gosh, no, I don't think I'd want to read it afterwards. Oh, I've got, like, at my parents' house, I've got, I mean, like, drawers and drawers of journals from since I was uh, my teenage years. And just occasionally, if I've got time, I sometimes, I, I mean, it is a That's hoot, yes. not necessarily fun. I mean, it is now it's funny because I, I've got time and distance between me. Yeah, right. But it's, it's, it is, it's like a, it's like a little, but I think, you know, a lot of journaling is not necessarily to be read. It's just, it's the act of, of cleansing and clearing out, like a lot of people have been saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, Emma teaches doctors journaling to GPs to help them cope with stress. Mm. So that that yeah okay so this is really interesting. Let's um, thank you for sharing the link as well, Ben. Um, and that, you know this is actually quite an interesting thing because um, different traditions actually do work with with a lot of this kind of thing. Like um, I've been doing quite a lot of work in you know the tan, kind of tantric um, Shaivism, and they do a lot of after meditation you journal. Mm. 
-hmm. and that actually the journaling after the meditation is almost like part of the integrative practice of integrating and kind of sealing in almost like a shavasana like the way you lie down after your your postural practice it's almost like the journaling mm -hmm. is like the shavasana for the meditation and it's very interesting um to have that process of just you know making a few comments of like what came up for you or if there were any particular stark images so it's interesting that it does exist actually within some of the broader yogic traditions within well. a yogic tradition that's really yeah. really fascinating um and you just touched on that word tantra, and I know that there'll be lots of people, and yeah, I always like to get a bit of clarification. Well, what yes, so um, tantra now basically, because of how our brain works, is like short-circuited to tantra sex, basically, um, which is a shame because actually it's this very rich, ancient body of literature, some of which predates yoga. Um, I, mean, I mean, really rich, deep, and, you know, it's way too rich and deep to really describe in a few sentences. But the way that I really understand Tantra and the way that I feel about it is that actually most modern yoga practitioners are much more Tantrikas than yogis. Because mm. from an ancient traditional point of view, the path of yoga traditionally, classically, was the path of a renunciate. You would leave the world, you wouldn't have, or if you had a family, you would leave it or you wouldn't have a family and you'd remove yourself from the world, from jobs, from everything, and you'd just be on a spiritual path mm -hmm. only. Whereas the tantric path was a householder path. It would be people who had livelihoods, who had jobs, who had families, who had children, and simultaneously had a spiritual path. So for me, that resonates much more mm -hmm. deeply. And also for me, Tantra is about embracing everything in life as the possibility to grow and evolve. Mm -hmm. And it also, you know, the, the underpinning of it is that everything is part of the whole. So even those gnarly, gritty experiences you go through are part of the greater whole and therefore mm -hmm. are to be as best you can embraced and honored and, and celebrated as part of life. So it's, it's a whole nother practice, but it's much more, um, I think it's just much more of what most modern people are doing. You know, the renunciates yeah. path was very strict. That was a lot of where the abstaining from this, that, and the other. And I find a lot of people that yogis come to becoming yogis and think, oh, but should I drink wine or should I do this? And actually, mm -hmm. you know, from a tantric point of view, they're saying, yes, if you do it with consciousness and it brings you into a state of joy and presence, then that is as valid if you're eating chocolate as you are drinking wine, as you are meditating. Mm. As long as it's done with consciousness and it's not based on your samskaras or your addictions, it's actually using your senses, using this human experience to embrace living in the world. And to me, that make, that's much more of a, a life affirming way of living than a life denying. And sometimes I find some of the like really purest um, ancient, ancient, like classical texts for modern yogis can be a bit off-putting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. That's very interesting. Thank you for clarifying. Because it's oh, really by the way, whoever just recommended that, someone's just recommended uh, Charles, um, uh, David yeah. Charles Manners' Limitless Sky. That is one of my literally all-time favorite books. Oh, interesting. It's okay. a bio. It's kind of like an autobiography about his life. And I, I literally could not stop reading. I love reading about. Um, people's spiritual journeys and lives and that one um is one i just suddenly saw because not many people i know have read it so amazing great oh nice one well thanks for sharing that then and it sounds like that's one that we should all be we could all delve into it's amazing yeah brilliant and i i love that um journaling is something that's really sort of touched a nerve here and it's something that i think a lot of us can be um can work with so yeah, yeah, I think that there's a lot of different thoughts, a lot of different practices and quite sort of concrete things that we've had, which which have gone from why we're actually tantric rather than yogi. Well, also, I think it's that beautiful thing of like diversity is a spice of life. Like for some people, journaling is just totally a medium for them. Mm -hmm. Other people, it needs to be more physical. Other people, it needs to be more, you know, emotional and they dance or they sing. And I think that's the beauty of having this massive diverse array of mm. practices on offer. And also just to be so open with ourselves that we allow at certain moments in our life, we might want to do more dancing. At other moments, we might want to do more meditating. At other moments, we might want to do more cooking as our, 
as our presence practice, you know? Mm-hmm. And not needing it to look a certain way, not being kind of bound by dogma, I think is important. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good one to um, to, to think about. Again, it's like that's how do I how do I live life a little differently? How how can things um, be a little, yeah to, just a bit more bespoke for what works for me as a human, as opposed to we're all wired so differently. So I think that's a, that's an interesting thing to maybe journal on. I'll be having a little journal on that tonight and. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if you guys that's resonating with you as well. Um, yeah, very interesting. It, it wouldn't be possible to put the book book remanda- recommendation. Oh, that sounds like a good thing to say, Heidi. I'm sure Raki will be <laughs> will be on that because that is a very very good idea, and we can put Ben's books and all the books that have been recommended here. That's really great. Now, do you guys have any other thoughts, any comments, anything that you wanted to share that you're feeling, you're going through um, about what it is to be here now or anything else that is on your mind as you're doing these practices and going through the retreat? You... Well, most people are thinking, I mean, this this is why I loved, because I just, I said to Kat, I had to bring this. This is uh, Be Here Now. How do you see it? There you go. Uh, by Ram Das, And this is basically my bedside table read. And so sometimes yeah. I will let you, I mean, it's, if you haven't seen it, it's the most beautiful book with just kind of extraordinary drawings and very profound wisdom. But that's one of the ways that I, I kind of come into the now is like sometimes I will just sit by my bed and just randomly open a page. And I'm always amazed by how it seems to speak to me and whatever I need on that particular day. So I was very happy. Yeah, yeah, I've got a copy of the book and I'm finding it pretty unintelligible, it has to be said, because I mean, oh, it's, it's oh, yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, I think that's the thing that you have to like set aside any idea of like this. I mean, you can read it chronologically if you really want to, but I found it really juicy to just be like, oh, today, what's today's inspiration? I'm a little bit obsessed by Ram Dass. I just think he's the most delightful, beautiful human, although he's recently departed, but yeah. That's cool. Lots of that. lots of wisdom and lot, you know, lot. I mean, it's filled with his learning and his wisdom around how to be here now. You know, he was the one that kind of coined yeah. or made that phase frame famous. Yeah, absolutely, and an incredibly wise and funny human being. Oh, so funny, so joyous. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, probably probably time to wrap it up. Um, yeah, what an amazing journey and discussion. I love it. I, I've really enjoyed this and I've really, really appreciated you all for chiming in and sharing what you're oh. doing, what you're reading, what you're going through, because I think contributing, it's very, very tempting in any of these things to sort of sit back and be a watcher. Mm. And it's very hard to put yourself on the line and to be a contributor. Um, but it really, really makes a difference to everybody. It uplifts everybody when we feel the presence of other people because there's no stupid comment or answer because there's always somebody who's feeling exactly that. So um, it's that sort of giving, it's that nature of giving, which is really, um, I'm loving so much from you. Well, and isn't it interesting as well? I mean, it's slightly off the topic, but you know, this idea within Buddhism of Sangha, like they talk about like the three jewels and Sangha community is one of the jewels. Mm. And I do think there's a lot to be said of the community. Like it's so beautiful to all come together and hear people's, you know, different thoughts because, Mm -hmm. you know, it's comforting on the, on the spiritual path. Sometimes it can feel lonely. And so I think it's really beautiful. Everyone's coming together. I also love that someone said that Ram Dass changed their life. Um, yeah. If anyone hasn't listened, they um, there's an artist, like we can post a link, but there's an art, a music artist called East Forest who r- does very beautiful music, who did a, co- a collaboration, I think last year maybe, where he took a lot of like snippets of Ram Dass talking and then mixed it with music. And I mean, it's one of the, well, for me, it's one of the most glorious things I've ever listened to. So um, we'll post wow. that somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. let's post that if we can find it. Thank you for that. And thank you so much, everybody. It's, um, yeah, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Raki. Raki. Thank you, Cindy. I'm looking forward to letting these ideas settle. Yeah, I think that's the thing. There's been a lot 
and you need to just see Harris, thank you so much. And thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Heidi, Julia, Hannah, Frankie, Dada, Lisa, Ben, and everybody who has joined in. I really, really, really appreciate that. And thank you, Lisa. Oh, pleasure, Treasure, always. I love it. I love our movers. I love our chats. <laughs> I do. And thank you, Laura. Okay, and have a very peaceful evening, everybody. And thank you, Lucy. Lots of love. Thank, thank you, love everyone. You. <laughs>